I'm a pilot, and most of what I've learned about methodologic approaches to safety come from the aviation industry. And so I've done my best to try to apply what I've learned in the aviation industry about safety to MRI. And if you stop and think about it, what is it that is different when you learn to fly than learn to drive? I'm, I'm assuming you guys drive a car. And how do you learn to drive a car? You get in the car. Somebody says, press this, it goes faster. Press this, it slows down. Press when it's yellow, slam it on the floor and get across the intersection before it can turn red. That's it. Now you know everything you need to know about driving. So all kidding aside, what's different about driving than flying? What's different about the, the, the methodology of learning? If anything, you might say maybe it's harder to learn to fly because you have three dimensions instead of two. So why is it that the safety record for commercial aviation is frighteningly safe. Why is it the safest means of transportation just about out there? And there's so many car accidents. What are the differences between them? I guess the margin of error. Well, the amount if of... you ever have a margin of error in, in a car, you run out of gas, you go walk to the nearest gas station. You don't have that margin of error in the plane, right? Right, that's true. Yep. If there's a margin of error, it's tipped towards the benefit of the car, not the plane. So if you go back and look at what is it that when people learn to drive versus when people learn to fly, what differentiates them? When, when someone learns to fly, there's two different things. There's two methodologies that I believe we're exposed to universally that a driver of a car never was exposed to when they learned to drive a car. And they are in no particular order. Number one, we use checklists. We use checklists. You get on a commercial flight, well, do you remember back then we used to have flights before COVID? Never mind. So you get <laughs> yeah, on a commercial <laughs> flight and you pass by the cockpit and you hear them, terrain, terrain, pull up, and you hear the, they're going through their different steps in the cockpit. You have to use a checklist. Everything is checklist, checklist, checklist. If you do everything perfectly on your check flight and you don't use a checklist, you failed on the spot. You must use your checklist. Don't ever abandon it. It prevents you from leaving a step out. That could be a, a major, a significant step. Oh, so as a pilot, you do that checklist the same way every single time you do it. Standardization. Wow. Every single time. Identical. And so the idea of checklists is one of the two things that we use in aviation that we don't use when we drive a car, but they work phenomenally. So the two apps that I've created, one of them is a checklist app. And the other, what else do we do in, in aviation? What do we use in learning to fly that we don't use when we learn to drive? To learn to drive, you grab the keys, you get behind the car, or behind the wheel, and away you go. Nobody's going to ask you to practice stalling a 787. So how do you stall a 787 and show, demonstrate that you can recover from it? You do that. How do you get all these emergencies in a $180 million airplane? You do this with simulators. So the entire approach to flying is that we could make a simulator that is so unbelievably realistic that the Federal Aviation Administration allows hours in a simulator to count towards minimum hours required to demonstrate certain tasks and certain experience levels. So you're duplicating that due diligence, basically. That's what it is. Wow. All those things, all, all these scenarios you want to prepare for, but you don't want to actually do it in a real aircraft, let alone with people on board. So this is how you can have an engine flame out. This is how you can practice a failure. This is how you can practice an in-flight fire. My flaps fail to and get my, uh, my wheels, landing gear fails to, to come. What do you, how do you practice an error that could be life-threatening? You practice it with simulation. So the Magnet Vision app is an MR environmental simulator, five cubic millimeter accuracy simulation of all these different MR scanners and the environment in the, in the MR scanner that you would expect to see when you bring that patient. It simulates the patient, it simulates the implant, it simulates the environment, it simulates the hardware, it simulates and depicts graphically the fields and the energies that you're going to be exposing that patient to analyzes them and gives you an output as to what the level of exposure would be before you actually go into the real world situation with that patient, with that implant, with that device or foreign body into that scanner. And the accuracy is just like real time? Well, it's as accurate. 
<laughs> as they say in programming, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> That's true. It's only as good as the program. As accurate right? as the information is in, right. the computer will give you that accuracy on the way out. Oh, that's awesome. So the idea of, of the simulation and the idea of checklists, we're trying to apply them towards evaluation of MR safety because it provides something that's fa- extremely important but pretty much missing throughout our industry, and that's standardization. To have a single standardized approach that you can apply every single time to assessing the safety of that patient or that device or this study and that magnet, the approach to assessing whether it's safe or not or whether there's the risk and the the benefit are appropriate to proceed with the scan or are they indicating that I should cancel the scan? The approach as to how to do that is standardized. The only thing that changes are the answers to the questions we ask every single time. The checklist is identical, but the answers are different from patient to patient to patient. In this situation, in that implant, in this position, in that study, in that magnet. And so we ask the same questions, but based on the answers, we determine what the risks might be and whether it's worth pursuing it or not. That's amazing. Because traditionally, you would think if something like, say, a knee, of the like you have an implant and um, it's a pacemaker that's conditioned up to 1.5, right? And that pretty much means you definitely can't do that on 3T for a knee or anything like that, right? Or wherever. Um, But what you're saying is that it's more patient-oriented, right? So, and more exam-oriented. So we're more evaluating not necessarily the implant, but the patient, the implant that he has, the exam that he's having, which is more well-rounded. Let me give you an example. Yeah. First of all, let me start off with telling you what it is that this, the so-called canal method, what is it actually doing? And then we'll use an example to answer that specific question. We've already discussed how a chest x-ray is one energy, one location, one distributed field of potential risks, and we know exactly where that is. But we said it's not the same in MRI. But we recognize that the methodology of reviewing, can I safely expose this patient to this test if she's pregnant? The methodology is very, very sound. What energy is being exposed where? Is the risk of that exposure to the fetus, to the mother, better, higher, or lower than the potential benefit of the study we're about to execute? And if it's substantially higher, we proceed with the exam. If it's substantially lower, we're not going to do that study. That approach makes perfect sense. So why not approach an MRI patient with the exact same methodology, but it's iterative? You have three different energies. Yes, so what? It's just math. So take the first energy, completely ignore the other two. I don't care which one you want. Let's say static magnetic field. That's one of the three energies. We're using a static magnetic field, three Tesla, one and a half Tesla, whatever. And that has its own potential risks. That has its own spatial distribution inside that MR scan room of where those energies will be when we're scanning this patient. Assess for that patient for the requested study Where are the energies? Where is the implant or the device or foreign body? What are the exposures to that energy? Is it exceeding any safety threshold or is it well below a safety threshold? If you've made it safely, yeah, that's not a problem at all. Super. You're just not done yet. That's not a problem. Great. Put it aside. Go to your next energy. Do it again. It's like you're simplifying it, basically. You're standardizing. Standardizing. You standardize it. You don't miss a step. Yeah. You go through all the potential risks, analyze them independently, and if you've made it through static field, if you've made it through gradient fields, if you've made it through radio frequency fields, those are the three main energy sources. Right. If you evaluate these three main energy sources, these flashlights that you're going to be irradiating your patient with, and every one of them, the risk is either not significant or the exposure is not that great, or, listen carefully, it may be that there's a high exposure but I can do something to mitigate the risk associated with that exposure. Yes, there's shrapnel. Yes, it could cause an injury. I can put, it's a small piece, I can put a pressure bandage and make the risk acceptable and mitigate the risk of it moving. They may get a black and blue mark, but nothing worse than an ecumenic uh, result from this study, and it won't be a significant injury. And I can, at the, on, the, on the other hand, I'll be able to tell if they have a hyperacute stroke. The benefit may massively outweigh a potential risk in that case. So if there is no risk from that energy, or you can find a methodology 
to mitigate that risk to acceptable levels. The RF can cause a significant injury, but I can decrease the amount of power I'll be depositing into this patient if I make the following changes to the sequence. If you get through the first energy, the second energy, the third energy, and there is either no significant exposure or you found a way to reduce it to acceptable levels, you sort of just ran out of reasons to cancel that patient, didn't you? Right.